So this is pretty much what he said, just in bullet points. Started out in the Air Force with cyber warfare and uh, been around the block for about 30 years in cybersecurity. And this is pretty much, if you've ever had, uh, are you, what's your role? Are you a CISO or director of IT? Or? Director of IT. Right. Team, so I'm pulling double duty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get this hairdo too at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, I totally, I totally understand. So really, the, the ransomware goes back around 2010. It was fairly uh, dispersed. You know, you know, ransom was about $100 to $1,000 and, you know, paid through, like, pay SMS messages. Um, around 2013, we started seeing ransomware as a service coming into play where they, the developers would develop it, they would sell out the service, and then the attacker could run and do what they wanted with it. 2016, we started seeing more of an advanced persistent threat um, with ransomware, where they'd get in and they would uh, lock down more machines than just the, the few, and the ransoms went up significantly. That's when they also started going into Bitcoin. I'm going to try to blow through the history quickly because it's really the, the most relevant stuff that's going on right now. So ransomware is a... What's that? On the Bitcoin, the number you had, what was that? Um, 10, 15 Bitcoin. Yeah, anywhere from 100000 to $500,000. And, and lately we've seen ransoms. I think the highest ransom paid is $50 million bucks. So, you know, with the ransomware as a service, they're now blending a lot of the, the different types of ransomware, which I'll show the different creators and, and actors in a sec. But um, they're trying to blend those, get the best of, best of what, they, uh, what they have to offer, and then getting rid of the cheap stuff, and they're just sell selling that out as a service. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the current extortion landscape has changed, obviously, from where it used to be, hey, we just encrypt all of your, your files, you pay us ransom, we get the key. Once NotPetya came out, and re we realized that there was no key. So if there, if there was a, uh, an attack that happened, and uh, they even paid the ransom, there was no key. So people stopped paying ransom. They're like, well, we can't guarantee that you're gonna give us a key. So we started seeing more of a multi-phased approach now or multi-extortion where they're going to steal your data and then encrypt your data. And then you have to pay an extortion for the key and you have to pay an extortion for them to delete the files and not release them to make them public. Um, I think we talked, I just went through that. In 2020, there were only about four main groups that were operating uh, throughout uh, throughout the world, and now we have a, a myriad more uh, a myriad of cryptocurrency to it. But here's some of the groups right now. Conti was actually number one, leading pretty hard. They attacked the uh, government of Costa Rica, and a huge international investigation came down on them. So they really put a halt to a lot of their operations. And Bitcoin, or not Bitcoin, um, uh, Lockbit. Uh, has really been increasing their attacks. I think as of s beginning of September, they had over a thousand attacks. At that point, you have a question. Do they have, yeah, do they have patterns of either industry or company types? Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll show where most of those attacks have have come into play um, by industry, and uh, it it really depends on they're looking for companies who can pay a ransom, you know, like Los Angeles. You know, LAUSD, the guy hacked San Bernardino a couple years ago, and they're still putting things back together from that one. LAUSD is going to be hurting for quite a while. Um, the the, in, the ransomware uh, ransom costs have increased. You know, the average payment is you know they're saying average ransom payment is two hundred and twenty eight thousand um, bucks, but we've seen them up as high as fifty million. So how that all kind of pairs out because most of the targeted organizations. Um, are below uh, 1,000, so which we'll get into. I'm saying 1.4 billion this year. I really want to get into a couple of those slides because we got started a little late. Um, and then average downtime is usually around two weeks to three weeks. Uh, is what we've seen so far, and uh, other, especially with agencies who refuse to pay for the key, uh, and they're just trying to restore from backups. So extortion targets. You know, we're really, again, looking at from zero, or I mean, one employee to 1,000 employees takes up, what's 82% of the uh, overall attacks, which is why when we're talking about 
these high ransoms that we're seeing being paid over a million dollars, why the average is only 228,000. It's because most of the attacks are on smaller organizations. Um, and then when, it, when we're talking about industry, you know, public sector is 14 and percent. So between public sector, professional services, and healthcare, those are kind of the main, the main targets for attack. And I know that, you know, just dealing with education and public sector, a lot of them, they don't have the resources or the finances to be able to attract, you know, the directors of security or CISOs into them. I'm working with a, a, uh, a school, a K through 12 school system right now that's, that has that issue. I'm trying to school up the director of IT to understand security better and help him develop a program because they just can't attract. They don't have the money for a, a CISO full time. Does that slide answer your question on the, the different? I, did, I, was, I was looking at the, the, you know, the utility percentage. It's a very small. Is that because they're not a profitable target? Um, I don't know if it's not that they're not profitable. I mean, they went after um, the uh, Colonial Pipeline, which can be considered utilities as well. And uh, that, was a, that was a big deal. I think some of them have actually stated that they're not going to go after critical infrastructure, like DarkSide, after they they attacked um, the Colonial Pipeline and they saw what kind of devastation that caused. You know, they said that they're never, they're not going to attack um, critical infrastructure anymore. Are you going to talk a little bit about source, you know, domestic versus international at some point? Um, a little bit. Most of it all is international and, and spread out. I mean, we've seen, you know, one group that has, uh, which I'll actually talk about here in a sec, the Lapsus group, they had, um, you know, actors in, in the US, in Canada, and a bunch in the UK that actually got caught, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and, uh, and then they're also spread out into about four other countries as well. So most of them are pretty widespread, unless you're talking about like Lazarus Group is a North Korean group um, that was active a few years ago, and they're still doing some activity, but theirs is very specifically targeted at financial gain, like the, the one that they um, were kind of most famous for is they made I think $74 million in a weekend because they had hacked the Swift, uh, of the Swift um, banking system and they were able to transfer money to a couple of different places to casinos. And it was just by chance, uh, a, a guy at a bank, a security guy at a bank noticed that the name of a spelling of a casino that it was going to was wrong. And so they started investigating the background of that and realized that, um, that all of this trans all these transactions were, were bad. And they stopped all of it right there. But over the weekend, the course of that three-day weekend, they had scheduled about $1.2 billion to be transferred. And they, you know, they still got away with $74 million, which is a pretty good weekend anywhere. Hello. Good morning. The what? Ah, OK. So on the uh, attack vectors, uh, RDP used to be a big attack vector. Um, and we started telling people to you know, shut down RDP on your machines if you didn't, weren't going to use them. And, uh, and they did. So those types of attacks are, are going down. Phishing is still like, one of the number one ways to get in uh, on the attacks. I guess I'll give, some, give people a sec. More. And then one thing we've noticed over the last year is a notable shift in um, the type, the way that they're getting in. It's not just um, with phishing and them clicking on a link, clicking on a, uh, an attachment that gets them, gets them hacked. They're now some of the groups like Lapsus that, uh, that I'll, I'll go into a little more detail when they're talking about other, these guys are using bribery to get account information um, from you know, credentialed users, you know, up to 20,000 bucks a week. Uh, and that's all social engineering, and that's essentially what happened with Uber and, and a bunch of others. So we'll, I'll show that. Um, the, if you guys have a, a, an EDR or an XDR console with your endpoint protection, one of the things that is really key for it to have is a connection back to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, because that's where a lot of your indicators of compromise are going to come from. So in, in simple things like uh, a who am I command, I mean, it's an Oculus command. Anybody can run it. 
you pull up a shell and you can run it. But the thing is, the reason it's a trigger is because I'm not going to log into my machine, pull up a console and type, who am I? I know who I am. I logged in. Somebody who ended up getting a remote connection doesn't know who they are and they don't know what permissions they have. So when that command is kicked off, that's like a first indicator of compromise and it will bring an alert up on a uh, XDR console if you, have, uh, if you have that ability. Speaking of console, so um, this is a, an attack. I'm going to see if this works this way here. If I can pause and stop it. OK, so um, with this particular attack, the first thing we saw was the one, the one line that was going out. And that was really after they, they clicked on a link and established a connection. And then now they have a, a two-way connection. This guy is now he's going from one machine, trying to figure out his accounts, using those accounts to try to find other machines. He's now bounced over to, um, what number is that, 102. And they're already starting to transfer data out to a, um, another site. And then you'll see towards the end it gets real fast. I mean, this is, this is over a period of an hour that they were able to get in. They got into four different machines. And this was all in a, uh, this was in a, a test lab that we ran. But we ran the malware and let it run, let them do what they needed to do. Uh, and so that is all based off of, you know, this first contact. They went out to two, two different sites. Let's see if this is a, Let me get to the next slide. There we go. And this is starting from 102. Same type um, traffic, but we're just monitoring where that's going out to. He's going to two, they're downloading and, uh, or uploading information back to command and control across multiple machines. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, so the first one was really focused on all of the traffic that 101 was, was working on. This is the same attack. It's just focused on, on 102 being the center point of all of uh, and its activity. So this is kind of the stuff you want to see with your XDR console. You want to be able to um, see these. And, and literally, this attack, the first thing that we got was a hit on a who am I command. And that's, the, that's where this all began. Um, and then you can see it play out. Then mitigation is a whole nother. Let's get past that. There we go. Um, one thing I want to talk about in the news was Lapsus Group, right? We have all heard the Uber attack. Um, Uber is not the only company these guys have attacked. They've attacked some major companies, Microsoft, Cisco, Okta, um, a lot of big boys, Uber, obviously. And uh, so Lapsus was discovered in 2020, kind of they're really kind of careless uh, with, with what they do, what they say on a lot of the boards. It ended up getting them caught, uh, some of them anyway. Uh, and the thing is, we, we kind of, we think they're, well, most of them we know were teens. In fact, there was a, they own a, a chat group that was really focused on, and it would, they were buying and selling credentials on this group. And there was another group that had the same thing. So the Lapsus group bought that other um, that other session as well, and they weren't maintaining it very well, so people were complaining, so they decided to sell it back to the original owners. When they did that, they released details of the owner's private information. So those guys ended up releasing information on the Lapsus group, including identities, names, um, pictures of houses, you know, all kinds of good stuff. So uh, there were several members that were caught, including the one they think is the, the leader of this was a 14-year-old kid. Um, and he was an autistic kid. His dad thought that he was just in his room playing games all day long, and he had $14 million in his account that his dad didn't know about. So um, they were quick released, and I don't know if they're still, if he's still back in operation with them, I would assume there's some kind of an order for him not to be around computers, um, not that they normally listen. But that was in the UK, so they busted him in the UK, so they can actually monitor him a little monitor him a little closer than we would if he happened to be in Russia, North Korea. And yeah, big game. These guys are big game. They're, they're bribing people to get credentials. Uh, like if you look at the, the bottom one, I think you can read that pretty well. They're, they're offering 20,000 bucks a week for you to give them your credentials and uh, allow them in with two-factor authentication. And that's 
kind of how they got in with, uh, with Uber. It was a contractor, and they ended up uh, spoofing some information. And he, once he got on the machine, he started putting up pop-ups on his machine all the time and with a phone number if you need to get rid of these calls. So call the number. He ended up talking with a hacker, and the hacker said, just hit accept, and it'll stop. And so he clicks accept, and it stops. Well, that just gave him, gave the attacker man in the middle attack with, with um, two-factor authentication, so they were able to defeat that. Uh, and uh, they, you know, again, they're into extortion and, and trying to make as much money as possible. Uh, but some of them are not in, uh, not, not in it anymore, but we'll talk about the different countries they come from in a sec. And this statement here from uh, anonymous CIO talking about, you know, we're prepared for a lot of these attacks, but, you know, what two or three logical accounts, you know, valid accounts can do in the next six hours you know, we're not really prepared to monitor that. It's, you know, that's a whole kind of a data loss prevention, you know, very expensive venture to get into controlling the specific access to specific files um, any user, a you know, credentialed user can have. Uh, we talked about a lot of this, I think, already. I, sometimes I go ahead, um, get ahead on my slides. I am... Uh, my ADHD just kind of kicks in and throws me all over the place. So these are some of the victims, right? These are all, all big companies, and they've made a lot of good money off of them. Like I said, actually, I think the kid was 16 years old, um, but he had 14, did have 14 million in his account, which is not a bad, not a bad week either. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get that far, but I would. I would probably assume you're right. Um, yeah. So law enforcement's been pressuring them. They they've actually been arresting some of them, but they're still in operation, obviously, because these these arrests happened several months ago, and Uber was just attacked last month. So they're still going, um, and they're geographically diverse. Again, there's there's a guy in the U.S., several in the U.K., um, spread out through Europe, uh, a couple in Russia, and it, it, they're all over the place. So it's kind of hard to, to catch, catch them all. And the diversity of attack is the one thing that's kind of unique with Lapsus is that they did not use any malware at all. There was no malware whatsoever on. They just went in old school, got the information, stole the information, didn't encrypt anything, uh, and then just sent a note back and said, hey, we have this information. We got it from you guys. And here, you know, we want this. Uh, you know, we, we want to get extort money from you. So these are some overall mitigation techniques. And again, I'll open, I guess I should have said something while we're walking in, but feel free to stop me at any time and ask a question. I, I, don't, I don't like just standing and presenting um, PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's pretty much it. You can't. You. you um, it, it, I think it all comes down to risk. Uh, what your it comes down to what your attorneys will say. Look, how bad is this information? If we don't pay the ransom, we know it's getting out. If we do pay the ransom, it probably won't get out. And I think a lot of it has to do with the history. The people who have paid the ransom, their information was not released. Whether they deleted the information or not, and it's still available for release. Um, I, I we know, we'll never know whether they delete it or not. Yeah, I just brought up this question that the, you know, the talk, the keynote speaker from CISA. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, let's say you say, we're going to have an attack. And what do we do? And what are the latest steps? He says, definitely don't pay the ransom. Contact the FBI, CIA. Let us take care of the professionals and move on from there. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's pretty much it. I think I've, I've got a slide that talks about what happens when you get hit, you know, the official answer, the non-official answer. Um, but these are, some, these are some tips and techniques that... It all that depends how much your insurance company is willing to... Yeah. And, and they have brokers. So you've got... They've got brokers that are preferred... They're preferred brokers for these ransomware guys, which they obviously... They already negotiate like a 30 to 40 percent discount with these brokers. So the brokers will come in and talk with, they'll be the middleman between the ransomware folks, and then uh, they'll be the ones that decide, you know, how much ransom is going to be paid. It's an interesting thing. 
Um, some of the mitigation techniques, obviously patching. And while we're still talking about this, I have no idea. Um, this kind of all came about, I don't see, maybe, but maybe one other guy in here who knows what Blaster and Sasser was back in 2000. The rest of you are probably barely born. Yeah. And it was, it was, uh, um, it was a wormable malware that was tied to a nine-month-old vulnerability, critical vulnerability that Microsoft had announced nine months before. And a lot of people didn't patch. And when that thing was released, even my, my team, my intelligence team that worked for me, they were telling me, look, the, they're in the middle of proof of concept for this thing. So it's going to be released probably in about seven days. And they're like going down and they're saying, they're going, it's going to be in three days. And I'm trying to get my CIO because we had 67,000 machines to patch. And I'm like, look, we need this tool. And at the time, it was Alteris. So to get in so we can patch all of these machines because Microsoft, it was just SCM at the time, couldn't do all of that. And he wouldn't pay it. You know, it was half a million dollars. He wouldn't pay it. And so we ended up, we got hit. And we had to pay every consultant we could find to walk around to system by system with a CD, put it in, reboot, patch, and... Uh, and go to the next one, and then he calls up the Alteris guys, and he said, yeah, we need your tool in here, and you know, we're really badly hacked, and we get there, and they're like, yeah, it's a million bucks. And he goes, I thought it was half a million. He said it was, but now you want me to pull folks off of paying gigs to come do this and to find some other assets, and that's not cheap. And we ended up getting it, and we paid twice. What's that? Yeah? Yeah. You were a semantic? Yeah. Yeah, I was too. Ten years. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about RDP ports. Um, disable them if they're not being used. Uh, and remove admin privileges. Anyone through K through 12 here? Support K through 12. For God's sakes, cancel the admin rights. Every single one I talk to, they're like, oh yeah, everybody has admin. That's just normal. That's the default. Oh yeah, uh, they're screaming. They they have they need admin rights to do their job, and and yeah, I've been through that where I was pulling admin rights from everybody who didn't need it, including myself. And people just sign the note. Yeah, I need admin rights to do my job, and their manager would sign. I'm like, no, you got to do better than this. And teachers need admin rights. I I don't get it, but. Not if you run them right. It's like whitelisting or blacklisting, right? If you if you use a whitelisting, um, and it only allows apps that you allow to run, if it's not done properly, then you can you know leave a hole. It's like a firewall. You know, if you put your any 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 in the front, it causes a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't haven't had any experience with those unless it's privilege access management, you know, for for administrators. Most uh, of it just seems like you can guarantee the folks that you're supporting that you can respond and do the things that need to do for admin rights in a timely fashion, then there will be a lot more acceptance of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the issues we identified with uh, tools like Threat Locker that allow you to do uh, privilege escalation uh, for just applications or on an application for application level. Um, the problem with those kind of software most like these jobs are already having a staffing problem, and then we're talking about a fairly expensive time and tool for uh, having staff who are on the same level. Yeah, automation is kind of key to that. I mean, in CDW, we have a, uh, a repository of software. So I don't have admin rights on my box, but if I go to that repository, I can install software from there. But I cannot install software if I want to download it from somewhere. So that works out real well for us. Yeah. 
A uh, couple other things to talk about, uh, network segmentation, uh, that's huge. I did an assessment at a hospital and I pl first thing I did is plug my laptop into an open port and I could see everything. I could see the, the EMR um, information, I could see finance, HR, their PCI environment. It was, I just stopped at that point. I said, let's do network segmentation first and then we'll carry on. I think at this point, if you walk into an organization, you see a Slack system, that's a problem. If what? If you walk into an organization, you see a Slack system, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, monitoring Active Directory, that's the first thing they want to go after. If they can get Active Directory and get control of that, now they have, they can do whatever they want with admin rights. Um, most up-to-date PowerShell, I want to get through this because I know I'm keep, probably keeping you from the next piece. We've gone through awareness training, um, but I can tell you as being, being our old red team guy, I was the, I was the guy that did all the uh, social engineering and there's really, there, I, I can get anybody to click on an email. All I have to do is create a, an emotional response. And if it, and with some of the ran, uh, ransomware, they're targeted attacks against individuals you can find out a lot of information about that individual. You know, you can go to, you know, easy play, easy things like Ben Verified, and you can find out where they are. It tells you their Facebook page. You can see where they've been. You can see the pictures of their kids where they go to school, and then you create an email from the school saying, asking them why their kid hasn't been in school for a week. Click here and please give us an explanation. Yeah. And they'll do it every time. I've even had my own CIO tell me I couldn't get him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other things, email security, like a good email security, something that, that has um, access to a data pool with, um, with malware-related sites, anything that's a C, known CNC, um, be able to disable those links before they even get to the user, removing suspicious attachments. I mean, that's kind of key to having like a full XDR, you know, what I call extended detection and response. Um, where you're not just doing endpoint, you're doing email, you're doing network, and you're tying it all together to get that same picture that I just, sh that video I just showed a little while ago. So, um, endpoint protection, auto, yeah, multi-factor authentication. For most, you know, ransomware, that's gonna stop them in their tracks because if they can't get to the next machine without MFA, then that'll stop them. But, uh, you know, as we've seen with the Lapsus Group, they. They'll pay somebody to get around it or they'll use social engineering to get around them. Uh, backups are a huge thing, air gap, but the big piece of that is test your restores. I can't even tell you how many companies I've talked to that have been impacted with malware and then they go to restore and they can't restore because um, they've never tested the actual restoration. They're like, hey, we do a full every month and incrementals every night and their full won't come back. So that, that test the, not just test the backups, test the recovery of those. So extortion payments, official guidance don't pay because the money's almost always going to some kind of a country where we uh, have you know, regulations against that. Unofficial guidance is the extortion payments should be made by leadership. Your legal team, your risk manager, um, and you know, if you have an IR firm or breach coach, those, those are the folks that are gonna help make that determination whether they should pay it or not. Uh, because um, they know best what the inf what information has is, is been stolen and whether they should try to pay it or not. However, if you do already have in your mind that if we get attacked, we're gonna pay ransom and you have cybersecurity insurance and all that, don't put any information about having the IR or the breach coach on retainer, don't put anything about getting a Bitcoin wallet ready in your incident response procedures because that pretty much shows that you've already planned it ahead as to what's going to happen. Um, this is pretty funny. We're talking about partner brokers. Um, I don't know how hard that is to read, but so uh, there's a, a company called Coveware that does a lot of forensics and um, and they'll do some brokering as well. But in this particular case, this company brought in Coveware and they were, the attackers were ticked off. They're saying, you gotta get rid of these guys and get one of our preferred brokers in here. And, uh, and it was funny because it says, you've, you've violated our, our data guidelines, or data recovery guidelines dictated to use. And then, I mean, their response was classic. The only thing we violated was your mother. I mean, uh, you couldn't get a better response than that. And they did not pay, obviously, the ransom. They just recovered what they had. And I know a lot of you guys have seen these. 
these are my favorite coves as growing up as a CISO. Um, you know, because we've always done it that way. Um, what's the second best option? That's usually from my CIO. Um, I need admin rights. We talked about that. If we haven't been attacked, why do we need that? I mean, that's, and so my role with CDW is really to meet with security leaders and help them develop IT security programs. I'm a non-billable resource, so if you go by the CDW booth, you can get in touch with those guys, and they'll get in touch with me. Um, and I'm more than happy to come down and help show what we're finding at other organizations and what we're seeing. Um, because these, if we haven't been attacked, why do we need that? I have a great solution for that discussion when you're talking, with get, talking about getting money. Um, I didn't go to non-related work side or didn't open any attachments. I mean, all of these. My favorite of all time is, um, this was right after Blaster and Sasser. It was, you know, what do we need to do to make sure this never happens again? And I've had that so many times, um, which is why this is pretty much me at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, you have to set a reasonable risk. You know, there's going to be an acceptable risk somewhere, right? You're going to mitigate as much as you can to where it's to that level where, okay, we're, we feel comfortable with the risk that we're sharing. But what I started doing when I was going up to the board to get money is I actually would do a full risk assessment. Right? We know these are our vulnerabilities. This is proof, evidence of it. And we know the threats that are out there, and they're attacking companies like ours, or they're attacking these kind of vulnerabilities. And this has been the outcome with those companies. So I take that information up to the board, and I present that as a risk presentation. Look, this is the risk we are currently in. So now that it is on your table, you can choose whether to accept it or mitigate. And so before, if something happened, it would be considered neglect. After they've been advised, if they don't do anything, it's considered willful neglect. And that's how people can go to jail. Um, final thoughts. So my thoughts on this is have a roadmap. So even if you don't have budget and you know what you need to do with cybersecurity, go out, set that roadmap out, get prices for all the tools you need, and just every six months go back to whoever your, your security um, vendor is and update those prices because if they're not going to do anything, you know, the board, they're not going to pay for it. Have those things in place because what happens is when you do get hit, um, the incident-based, what I call it incident-based spending, it comes fast, it comes hard, and they'll give you everything you need to get the company back online and to get it secure, but memories are short. So within about six weeks to two months, they're going to forget about it, and then that whole comment of, well, if we haven't been attacked in the last two months, we must be good, right? So we don't need to spend any more money. So have that plan up in advance and get everything paid for at that time. And then you can schedule with the vendor um, when they can have teams come out and help install it. But sorry, I ran a little bit long. But any questions? Okay.